Hi, welcome to Unit 7. So this unit is all about a tool called Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a really useful CSS and JavaScript library. We'll talk more about what a library is and what that means in the next unit. But basically, it helps us make really good looking sites much faster than we would without it. And in this unit, we have four main objectives and then two projects that we'll do towards the end. The first objective is that I just want you to be able to explain what Bootstrap is, what a library is, and how those work. So just conceptually, a quick overview of, of how these pieces fit together and what a library is. And then I want you to be able to include Bootstrap in your own applications two different ways. The first is by downloading it and including it locally. And the second is by using something that's called a CDN. And then once we have it installed, there's two objectives that relate to actually using Bootstrap. Bootstrap comes with a bunch of different components, a lot of different pieces, and I'm going to highlight some of the most important ones. So our third objective is that you get comfortable using things like the form controls in Bootstrap, the buttons, the nav bars, and some of the other important components. And then the fourth objective is that you get comfortable using the Bootstrap grid system to make nice responsive layouts. And we'll spend a lot of time on that one because there's a lot to know about the grid. We'll have a few videos devoted to it, as well as the final two projects. So the first project will be a Bootstrap-based image gallery, just like we did in the last unit where we made an image gallery, but this will be using Bootstrap. And I'm doing that really so you can compare the two experiences, see how easy it is to create something without Bootstrap, and then how easy it is to do it with Bootstrap. And it will look a little bit different. It won't be all black and white. It will have a different nav bar, so it will be a different experience. And then the final project is we're going to create a landing page for a fictional startup. And that will use a lot of the components as well, the grid system, nav bars, some of the buttons and bootstrap, and basically everything that we covered so far in this unit. And before we get started, I do want to point out that this is our last CSS only unit. Next, we're going to cover JavaScript. We're going to take a step back from making websites, from making real applications that look nice, just to focus on JavaScript. But then we'll be coming back full force. Once we finish up the JavaScript basics, we'll start making applications again. So this is our last chance for a little bit to make some real finished products. So that's why we're doing two solid projects at the end of this unit. OK, let's get started. Welcome back. In this unit, I'm going to introduce a new tool called Bootstrap. And I'm on the Bootstrap homepage, getbootstrap.com. And I just want to take a few minutes in this intro video to explain what Bootstrap is and why we're using it. And then also to show you a few examples of sites that use Bootstrap. So let's begin just by reading the official Bootstrap blurb. Bootstrap is the most popular HTML, CSS, and JavaScript framework for developing responsive mobile-first projects on the web. Let's break that down a little bit. Bootstrap is extremely popular. In fact, it's the most starred and forked repository on GitHub, which basically means that it has the most people using it, the most people favoriting it on GitHub. And all that Bootstrap is is actually a single file of CSS and a single file of JavaScript. Now there's a lot of CSS and a lot of JavaScript in those files, but they're just two files, and we can include them in our own application. Basically, we take someone else's code from Bootstrap, we add it into our own application, and it helps us make good-looking sites that are responsive, and it helps us make them fast without having to write a ton of our own code. There are two main reasons that I'm showing it to you in this course. The first is that it's very popular. Lots of places use it, lots of companies, lots of developers use it, and it's just worth knowing. But the second is that it's going to help us make good-looking websites pretty quickly in this course. So when we're learning back-end stuff, when we're focusing on Node and Express and Mongo and Mongoose, and we're knee-deep in all of this complex back-end logic, we can still make something that looks good without having to devote an hour or two-hour video to styling something. We can plug Bootstrap in, and we can get things going in 10, 15 minutes, and it will look pretty good. The next thing I'll do is give you a quick tour of the docs. Bootstrap has famously good documentation lots of good examples, and they actually use Bootstrap on this website, which makes sense. So let's start by clicking on CSS. And as I mentioned, Bootstrap is just a single CSS file, a single JavaScript file. Inside that CSS file, there's a bunch of stuff that we get for free. So let's take a look at buttons. So if we want to make a button and we have Bootstrap included in our application, we can add this class, two classes actually, BTN and BTN default and we get these buttons. We can do different colors. Let's take a look at forms. We get nice inputs here. And it's also really important to note everything is responsive on this site. So you can see we get things that respond to the width of the screen. We also have different types of forms. You can combine the different pieces. So here they're using a button with a form. So it's like Lego pieces. 
Bootstrap, in a lot of ways, is just a bin of Lego pieces that you can put together and add to your site as you see fit. We'll be going over most of these components, most of these big pieces, uh, once we start working with it and writing Bootstrap code ourselves. So for now, we'll move on. I'm going to show you the next tab, which is Components. Components contain some of the bigger pieces of Bootstrap that we can use, and that includes things like nav bars. And this is probably one of the most popular aspects of Bootstrap that lots and lots of sites use, as you can see, with a little bit of code. And it does look like a lot, but I assure you it's a lot less than it would be if we were writing a nav bar from scratch. And this comes with drop downs, a form, and there are multiple types of nav bars, different colors, some that are fixed to the top of the page, some that will scroll. There's other components like the Jumbotron, which is a way of showcasing some content on your website, progress bars, and these all come with Bootstrap. So you might be wondering right now, if Bootstrap comes with all these pieces and they're already pre-styled, wouldn't every site that uses Bootstrap look the same? And the answer is yes and no. It depends on how the site uses Bootstrap. I would argue that a company or a project that uses Bootstrap well makes it hard to tell that they're actually using Bootstrap because they use those main components and then you can go in and write your own styles on top. Change the colors, change the fonts, change some of the hover effects. You don't have to use the exact same colors and everything that come with Bootstrap. But that doesn't mean that there's anything inherently bad in using the built-in Bootstrap styles either. And we'll definitely be doing both. So when we're making a site and the focus is not really on the front end and we just want to make something that looks presentable quickly, basically prototype a front end, we'll use Bootstrap and we won't really modify many pieces. But then if we're working on something a little larger, something that we don't want to look like we use Bootstrap without changing anything at all, then we'll go in and add some of our own styles, basically add a coat of spray paint on top of Bootstrap. The next thing I want to do is show you some of the sites that are built with Bootstrap. And Bootstrap actually has an official website where they showcase some of those sites. If you click on Expo, I have it open already, you can see that they showcase beautiful and inspiring uses of Bootstrap. So we can open some of these, just open them in new tabs. And these are just the most recent ones. There's hundreds on this site. As you can see, tons and tons of them. And we can keep scrolling and scrolling, and then we can go to view older. And there are so many different sites that are using it, and they don't really all look the same. Yes, maybe a lot of them have a nav bar. Maybe a lot of them have this full screen, large image layout, but that's more of a design trend than something that Bootstrap is purely responsible for. So let's take a look at some of these. This one is Creative Tim, which is a company that makes website templates actually. And you can see we have this nice grid of images. It's very responsive. If I shrink this down, we get our little nav bar here. So this is a bootstrap component. The way that everything is laid out in this grid, bootstrap is partially responsible for that. But you can also see that they're not using the default built-in bootstrap buttons. They've changed them, things look different. So I think this is a really nice use of bootstrap. It's a really nice looking site, it works well, and it uses bootstrap, but it doesn't rely on bootstrap 100%. Let's take a look at one or two more. So this one is called Indicus or Indicius, something like that. Apparently they design and build digital products that people enjoy using. So let's scroll down here, take a look at what we have. So you have some content that's probably built with a bootstrap grid system, which helps organize and lay things out. Layout, as I've mentioned before, is notoriously difficult in pure CSS. It's getting better, but bootstrap is really, really useful to help us lay things out on our application. Then we have this little footer bar, there's a nav bar up here. So it's really fun to go to Bootstrap Expo, take some time to explore some of the projects that use Bootstrap and see how they use it and all the different ways that companies are modifying it, adding in their own fonts, their own colors, and really figure out what are the core components that lots and lots of sites are using and why do sites use Bootstrap. And in my opinion, it really comes down to the grid system, which we'll be devoting a video in this unit to, and the nav bars and the responsiveness of everything. Okay, so to wrap up, I'm gonna show you a simple site that we'll be making. This is our startup called Heavy Petting. <laughs> it helps you find your perfect feline soulmate. And it uses Bootstrap. You can see we have a nav bar up here. Just like that, we have sign up, login buttons, we get these little icons. Then we have our text here, and a little tagline, and then our button. 
And then as I resize things, everything is responsive. You can see things are moving around, shifting around. But most importantly, we get that little hamburger and we have a mobile friendly nav bar. So at the end of this unit, we'll be working on creating this fake startup landing page that matches people and pets in romantic relationships. Welcome back. In this lesson, I'll show you how to install Bootstrap into your own applications. And then once we've done that, I'll show you some of the important basics of using Bootstrap. So I'm on getbootstrap.com, just on the homepage, and there's a link here, download Bootstrap. And it's not actually a direct download link because we have two main choices for how to use Bootstrap. We can either download the files, and I'll do that to start, and then we can take those files and add them into our application. Before I go any further, I do have a simple HTML file that I'm calling basics.html, and I'll just add a title. And we'll just add in a few different elements of Bootstrap once we have it installed. So we won't make anything comprehensive. We'll just use it as a playground for some of the basic Bootstrap components. Okay, so let's start by adding just a simple h1, Bootstrap Basics. And save. And then let's open this up in the browser. Just keep that there for now. Now to install Bootstrap, I did download it. So if I open up that file, you can see inside of here, there's a few different components. There's a CSS directory and inside the CSS directory, there are quite a few files, but there's really only one important file, which is bootstrap.css. And this is actually the same file here, bootstrap.min.css, except it's been minified, it's been shrunken down to take up less space. So these two are the important files to actually use bootstrap. Then this is a bootstrap theme. All three of these are used to help add a custom theme to bootstrap. So that doesn't matter as much. All we need is bootstrap.css. And I'm gonna start by just opening it up so you can see what we're working with. This is the main bootstrap CSS file. It's just a lot of classes. If you look at every single line of CSS almost is a class declaration, dot something. And then what we can do is use those classes inside of our applications. So if we wanna have a button with white text and a red background, we're going to apply dot button danger. And that's what this is doing here. Dot button danger has white text, a red background and a reddish border. So let's go ahead and include this in our application, just like any other CSS file. So what I'll do is just drag it over here into the same directory where I have my basics.html. And I could also do bootstrap.min.css in place of this one, it doesn't really matter. Technically this one loads a little faster because if I open it up, you can see it's this one giant line, all the white space has been removed. So it's easier to load, but I'm gonna use this longer version just so that you can see exactly what we're working with. So now we're going to go into our actual file here. I'll close this down. And we're going to include bootstrap.css. So just like any other style sheet, we need a link tag and the href is bootstrap.css. And if we save and we refresh our page here, you'll notice a slight difference. Watch the font on this H1, it changes. We now have bootstrap installed or at least the CSS that goes along with bootstrap. And that's all we'll need for now. We won't be working with the JavaScript just yet. There is another option for installing bootstrap that they actually give to you on the get bootstrap website right here bootstrap CDN, we can take this link right here and add that to our code. And it's a link to a hosted version of that same file. So if we open that in the browser and paste that in, you can see it has the contents of the minified file and it's hosted at this URL. So we can just have a link to that URL. So I can replace that with another link tag and paste that URL in and I'll comment this one out for now and go back and refresh and nothing changes. The only difference is that in the first case, we had the file downloaded on our computer that we're linking to. And in the second case, we're linking to an external file that's hosted online. Now let's go to the bootstrap docs and start playing around with some of these components. So we'll go back to get bootstrap and let's click on CSS. And I'm just gonna point out some of the more important pieces that we'll be using. So let's start simple with buttons. If we wanna use a button, all that we have to do is use a btn class 
followed by a type of button. There's BTN default, which will give us a white button, but there's also BTN primary, BTN success, info, warning, danger, and link, and they all are styled slightly differently. And of course, we can change these colors on our own, but we're gonna just use the built-in ones to start. And as you can also see up here, we don't have to only use a button element. We can use an anchor tag, a button, or an input. So let's try that out. Below this H1, let's just add in a button tag. And this button tag should just say, click me. And if we just refresh the page right now and take a look at that, it's a pretty ugly button. But if we go and add that class, BTN, and then BTN, let's do success and save. We now get this awesome green button. So pretty easy to get some basic styles going. And let's go back and I'll show you a few other things about buttons. There are different sizes that we can use as well. And it's really easy. We just need to add in either button large, button small, or button extra small. So let's try it out after button success, and it doesn't have to go after, it doesn't matter the order of the classes, but I'll do it after here, BTN, and let's do extra small. And refresh our page, there we go. And I'll move this over now, and let's add in a few more buttons, but this one will be an anchor tag. And this will be an A tag, where we have href equals http colon slash slash www.getbootstrap.com, and then the text will just say, bootstrap docs, let's make this a little bit bigger. And then we'll add in class and class needs to equal BTN. And let's do BTN dash info and we'll make it large BTN dash LG and refresh. We now have two buttons. One is an actual button element. Another one is an anchor tag. And if I click this, you can see it is an anchor tag. So already in the first minute of using Bootstrap, we've been able to get decent looking buttons that would have taken 10 to 15 lines of CSS on our own to replicate. Let's go back now, make this full screen again, and I'll show you a few other things about buttons. So we have sizes. We also have different states where we can make a button appear as if it's active. And to do that, we just add the active class. So if we try that now, let's add in a few buttons. So I'm gonna duplicate our little miniature click me button three times. And on the last one or on the middle one, I'll add the class active and refresh. And you can see, hopefully that shows up well enough on the screencast that this one appears active. Let's go back and we can also disable a button by adding in this attribute disabled equals disabled. Let's go back and let's disable the last one. Refresh. And now this button is disabled. We get that nice little icon. It doesn't have a hover effect where it changes color anymore. It's clearly a disabled button. Great. Last thing I'll show you is that we can change the colors again. So button danger, and that gives us that reddish orange. And you can see all the colors here. And of course you could change those by overriding the styles. So you could do something like this. Rather than making another style sheet, I'll just do it here for now. So we're just gonna do one line and we'll select dot BTN danger. We can change the color to be orange. And now my BTN danger, the text is orange. And if I wanted to actually change the background, I could do background is orange. And that's how you can go in and override the styles. So you don't have to use what Bootstrap gives you out of the box and most places don't. Okay, so that's buttons, and that's all I'm gonna do in this video. I just wanted to give you a really quick taste of how Bootstrap works, this pattern of adding classes to existing elements, and those classes are defined in that bootstrap.css file. In the next video, I'm gonna highlight some of the other important pieces that come with Bootstrap, including forms and inputs. Welcome back. In this unit, I'm gonna show you a few other components, including jumbotrons and Bootstrap forms and inputs. But before I do that, I wanna take a moment to address something that's really, really important when we're learning new tools like this, like Bootstrap. And in my experience of teaching people to become web developers, I've noticed that Bootstrap is one of the first places where some of the students start to feel uneasy, 
uncomfortable, and they feel like they don't know what they're doing. And that's because we're suddenly including a bunch of code someone else wrote into our application. And if you take a look at the docs here, they're really long, they're comprehensive, which is great, but there's a lot here. And I want you to frame this not as a manual that you have to read in order to understand everything. This is not like a how-to guide that you have to finish before we use Bootstrap. It's a reference where if you decide you need a form, you look at the form section. If you need a table, you look at the table section. If you need a nav bar, you look at the nav bar section. But it's important that you treat the docs like that. You will be using them nonstop, coming back to here, referencing individual bits of code, copying their code segments, checking out some demonstrations, reading examples. I've been using Bootstrap for years at this point, and I feel pretty good about most of it, but I leave the docs open when I'm working on anything with Bootstrap. I'm constantly referencing the examples. In one of the really early videos in this course, I talked about how to become a web developer, you're not becoming an expert in memorization and in knowing every bit of information. Yes, you need to know things. Yes, you have to understand and memorize some things, but you're not becoming an expert in memorization. You're becoming an expert in accessing information. And some of that information you'll have memorized, and a lot of it is going to be online in documentation or examples, videos, books, all sorts of resources. All right, so to sum up that entire pep talk, basically, I just want you to keep in mind that, yes, there's a lot to bootstrap, and you're gonna see 20, 30% of it, and there's a lot more out there, but don't be intimidated by that. You should feel comfortable accessing the docs. If you need to do something that I don't show you how to do, open up the docs and look for it. And there's always great examples and explanations on getbootstrap.com. Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to talking about some of these important components. And I'm gonna start by showing you Jumbotron. So a Jumbotron, according to the official docs, is a lightweight, flexible component that can optionally extend the entire viewport to showcase key content on your site. You can see an example of one right here. And if we want to use a Jumbotron, it's really, really easy. All we need to do is write div class Jumbotron. And then whatever we put inside of that will be part of the Jumbotron. So let's try that. Just do it below our buttons. We'll have a div with class Jumbotron. Jumbotron, and then inside of there, let's do an h1, and our h1 will say, this is a Jumbotron. And then let's add a button in there, just like they have here. And we'll add a paragraph as well. And our paragraph will just be gibberish, good enough for now, and a button. And our button will just say, hi there. Okay, and then a button, we have a few choices. We'll do a button success, and we'll make it large. And save. And let's take a look at what we get. And there's our Jumbotron. You can see that it takes up the entire width of our browser window. And that's not usually what we want. And what's happening is that the Jumbotron is set up to take up 100% of whatever container it's inside of. And in this case, it's not inside of anything. But shortly, I'll be showing you the grid system in Bootstrap where we can control exactly how much we want this to take up of the screen. If we want it to be centered and take up a third of the screen, two thirds of the screen, a quarter of the screen, we have all these different choices we can make by using Bootstrap's grid system. For now, I'm gonna show you another element we can add in, which is a div with class equal to container. And what container will do, if we just put stuff inside of div class container, it gives it some spacing, some padding around it, and it centers things. So the container, if I inspect it, takes up all of this space here, so you can see, but it has quite a bit of margin on it. So if we just want a quick improvement without having to use the grid system, which we haven't talked about, we can add div class container. And now we get this nice looking Jumbotron. And if we move this code that we already have down into the container as well, but we won't put it inside the Jumbotron, you'll see that it still is affected by that container. So outside the Jumbotron, but inside the container, save and refresh, you can see it's also inside that container and it reflects that visually. Okay, let's head back to components. And the next thing that I'll show you, if we go to the top, 
we have to go over to CSS and I'll show you the forms and how those work. So click on forms and there's quite a few different types and different examples and I'll just scroll through them first before we type anything. So here's a basic example of a bootstrap form. You can see the markup that creates it. Then we have what's known as an inline form. Then we have another type of inline form and yet another one with different types of inputs. And then another type of form. And now this talks about all the different type of form controls, the different types of inputs that are supported. So all of these, color, URL, email, number, week, time, and so on. Text areas, different checkboxes, disabled checkboxes, disabled radio buttons, inline checkboxes, inline radio buttons, drop down menus, selects, keep going down. We have other form states. We have a focus state. You can see this highlighting around it, that blue. That's the default bootstrap focus styling. We can also disable inputs by adding in disabled. And we've also got a few other things we can do, but I'm gonna go back up and really focus on the basic example to start. And I'll start by just copying this entire form over, and then we'll dissect it bit by bit. So let's go back here, and we'll just add this form after everything else, but I will do it inside the container. So let me make this full screen for a moment. We have our form, and inside that form, we've got quite a bit of content. Let's go back to the browser and take a look at what it looks like. And the first thing you'll probably notice is that our form goes all the way across this container. It takes up 100% of that width. And that's something we'll be able to control once we talk about the Bootstrap grid system. And we'll easily be able to say, this should go 50% of the way across. So that's something we'll be able to easily change once we talk about the Bootstrap grid system. But we're not there just yet. So we're just gonna go with it. It takes up 100% for now. It's a gigantic, weird looking form, but that's fine. We love it how it is. So we'll go back to Sublime and let's dissect this one piece at a time. So we have a form tag. And inside of that form tag, there's a div class form group. And if you wanted to know more about what that does, you can go back to the bootstrap docs and do a search for form group. And you can see wrap labels and controls in form group for optimum spacing. So if we get rid of that form group class around this first one, and we'll do it around the first and second one, you'll see what we end up with. I'll save and refresh. You see how the spacing changes here between those inputs. So we can go back and add that form group. And this is really how you use it, where you have an input and a label and you want them to be grouped together. You use form group. So pay attention right here. Just a little bit of space is added right there. It just adds a little bit of space right here, which effectively groups these two together visually and then groups these together visually, as well as these down here. So that's form group. And then the labels are just normal. We don't have to add anything fancy to the label, no bootstrap class. But the input, there is a class, form control. So let's see what happens when I get rid of it. So I'll just do it on the first input, the email input, and go back and refresh. Notice that this completely changes back to a normal default browser input. So we don't get the rounded corners, we don't get the same padding and spacing of things, and we also don't get the same focus effect when I click, we do get a blue outline, but it's different than this one. The bootstrap outline is a little more subtle. And those are just the immediately obvious visual changes between the two. But there's actually some more important differences that you'll see once we get working with the grid system and the way that they behave and interact with other elements. But we'll go back and add form control again. So really, if we wanted to distill this, everything here boils down to form group and form control. Those two classes are really responsible for making things look good. Now there is this paragraph class help block, and we can take a look at what we get from that. It's this text down here, which just gives a little hint, a pointer about part of your form. And that's done with the class help block. And then we have our button down here, which is just a regular bootstrap button, where we have BTN and BTN default. And we could make it larger or smaller, or extra small, change the color, just like any other button. So already you can see how this is a little bit like Legos, where we have a button Lego that we can add into a Jumbotron, 
We can also just add it on its own, or we can add it instead of a form. It's just a little plug and play component that we can add into different parts of our application. So let's go back and take a look at one other type of form, which is the inline form. So this looks slightly different. If we just copy this code over and we take a look at what the difference is, so I'll leave that first form and let's add a comment down here, inline form. And let's indent things properly. Looks good. Notice that everything is identical. We still have form control on the inputs. We have form group, but there's one big difference. Everything's inside of a form with class form inline. So that one line, let's just show you what it looks like to start. If I go back, gives us this nice inline form here. And as soon as I get rid of that and save, it now goes back to a regular form like we have up here. So just one class contains all the styles that will control that. So we'll keep it as form inline. And again, the spacing is not ideal right now. That will be fixed when we talk about the grid system. There's plenty more we could talk about around bootstrap forms. We could probably do 30, 45 minute lecture on just building complex forms with bootstrap, learning the ins and outs of all of these different pieces and different things that we can do, validations, custom sizing, all sorts of different styles we can work with, but I'm not gonna do that. We've covered the important basics. Those two types of forms are kind of the bread and butter of bootstrap forms, where we have the basic regular form and then an inline form. And there will be a few other features and different aspects of bootstrap that we do use around the forms. But rather than spend time right now and bog you down on all the ins and outs and the small details of bootstrap forms, I'll just throw in those little pieces when we need them when we're actually using bootstrap. So the two takeaways here about forms would be two classes that are really important, form control and form group. Form control makes the inputs bootstrapified. Form group just adds some nice spacing. So whatever you put inside a form group gets some nice spacing. And then single class form dash inline. If you wrap a form in that, the entire form goes inline. And then we also talked about jumbotrons, very simple. Class equals jumbotron, as you can see up here. And then we put everything inside of a container. And if we get rid of that container, just show you what happens. Refresh. All that spacing, all that nice margin goes away. So a container is a nice way just to get a quick bit of spacing on your app, make things look relatively nice. Okay, so before I end this video, I'll spend 10 seconds showing you a site that we're going to build, an application that has a full backend database connected. We're using Node and Express and Mongo and Mongoose and a bunch of technologies. And we use Bootstrap to prototype the interface to make it look relatively good pretty quickly. And you can see we have a Jumbotron right here. We're using some of the buttons. We're using the grid system that I'll explain later. And then if I go to log in, you can see we have a form. So these are form controls that I've styled using the grid system so that it doesn't take up the entire width of the screen. Rather, it only takes up this little middle section. So we'll see that once we talk about the grid system. But I just wanna show you that this is a real application and it's something we'll use Bootstrap on to help us prototype and get things looking decent pretty quickly. Welcome back. In this lesson, I'm gonna show you one of the most important and widely used components in all of Bootstrap, which is the navbar. So you can see actually on getbootstrap.com, they use a navbar component right here. We're also gonna use one on our Yelp camp application. And as I resize the navbar, notice how responsive it is. And then also notice as soon as I hit tablet size and mobile size, we get this nice hamburger. So we'll be working towards all of that in this lesson. But we're gonna start simpler. First thing we need to do is go to components and go to navbar. And before we go much further, I have created a new file just because we'll be writing quite a bit of code. The old one was getting cluttered. I'm calling it navbar.html. Inside, all I have is the link to bootstrap. And I'll change the title here. I'll just call it bootstrap nav bars, just like that. Now let's go to the docs and take a look at the default nav bar. So this example here showcases all of the important features where we can have a brand link, we can have other links, we can have drop down menus, we can have a nav bar form and a button. We can have things that are on the right side, things that are on the left side, 
this really showcases everything. It's the kitchen sink of bootstrap nav bars, and consequently, the markup is a little bit long. We will be working with all of these pieces by the end of this video, but I want to start simpler. And I'll start by showing you the simplest way to make a nav bar. So we need to make a nav element, and that nav element needs to have two classes. We want nav bar and nav bar, and we can start with dash default. We'll save, and now let's go look at the file in the browser and refresh. You can see, I hope it comes across in the screencast, there's a nav bar, very faint bar going across the top. So that's that, that's how we actually initialize the nav bar. Now let's fill it with some content. The first thing we'll take a look at is how we can add in this brand here, basically your company name in most cases. And that's using a navbar header, and then inside the navbar header, we use a navbar brand. So let's start by adding that div class equals navbar dash header. And then inside of there, we're going to add in navbar brand, which is an anchor tag. Usually when you click on that company name, it takes you back to the home page. So we'll do that here, anchor tag, and we'll start with the href equal to octothorpe so it doesn't take us anywhere. Class will equal navbar dash brand. And we'll just make up a company name. Let's see, I've got a coffee cup around me. So let's go with coffee. But to actually make it a true startup, we need to change the spelling a little bit. Okay, that looks good enough for me. Coffee with a K. Let's go take a look. Refresh. And we now have our navbar brand, which is a link. I click on it. It doesn't take me anywhere right now, but eventually in our applications, we'll have it so that when you click the company name, it takes you back to the home page. Next, let's see how we can add in some other links like contact, about, sign up, register, all those common links in the navbar. Let's start by adding an about page link right here. So we'll go back and then outside of the navbar header, we're going to make another div and this div will collect all of the content, at least on the left side of our navbar. So we have the header, and then we'll have some content. And then if we want something on the right side, we'll have another div that has another class. So the class here, it's actually two. We want nav and nav bar dash nav. Don't ask me about the naming there, nav bar dash nav. It's one of the big criticisms of Bootstrap is that it's a little bit ugly and it's not very meaningful sometimes. And there's actually a CSS framework that was created in response to the semantic meaninglessness of Bootstrap, if you will, called Semantic UI. And that's one that I really enjoy as well, and I debated teaching, but in the end, it's just not as widely used. There aren't as great tutorials yet. So back to our div here, class navbar nav, and the class nav, both of those. And then for each item that we want on this navbar, we need to add an li. And then inside the li, if we want a link, we just add an anchor tag. So this one will just go nowhere once again, and this will be to the about page. And if I go back and refresh, we now have a link to about. Let's add one more to contact. Save, go back. Now we have two links. Now let's go ahead and add something to the right side of the page. Let's add two links, one for register or sign up and another for login on the right side of the nav bar. To do that, we need another container here. And actually, instead of using divs, it's more conventional to use a uh, UL. It will work the exact same way, but you wanna have LIs inside of a UL. Even though they'll work just fine with a div, it makes a little more sense to be inside of a UL. So we're going to add another UL, and this one is going to be nav, navbar, dash nav, and then navbar, dash write. And we need to make sure we spell that correctly. Otherwise that class won't take effect. So what this will do is make us a new group of content for the right side of that nav bar. And now we just need to fill it. So we'll add two links, both in LIs. The first one will go nowhere and it will say sign up. And then we'll have another one that just says login. Let's take a look, refresh the page. And you can see we have content on the right. However, it's right up against the edge and to fix that, we can add in a container to our navbar, just like we used a container earlier to add some spacing to our main content. We could add one inside of a navbar. So we'll put everything in the navbar inside of a container. So class equals container. 
Then we'll just move this down, make sure everything's indented properly. There we go. Let's test it out. Nice. So now everything is centered nice and correctly. I will show you if I did add the container outside the nav and I put the entire nav bar inside, you'll see what happens now if I refresh. Our nav bar is actually cut off and it only goes part of the way across the screen. So a container will do that to whatever we put inside of it. And in this case, we want the container inside of the nav bar so that it's not constricting the actual nav bar itself, but it is restricting the content inside of it. Okay, so div class container, we have our header, we have the stuff on the left, and we have some content on the right, as you can see here. Now let's step it up a little bit and go and take this basic nav bar or the default nav bar that they have in the docs. And let's copy this entire thing. And I'll just put it right below our nav bar. Make some space. I'll add a comment in to make it clear. Default nav bar. And let's take a look at it. Refresh. So it's this nav bar here. And there's a few things I want to highlight. One is that we have drop down menus, but they don't actually work. And also, as we resize the window, we get the hamburger menu here. Those links go away, the form goes away. And to reveal them, we need to click here, but that doesn't work either. So let's begin by getting it to work, and then we'll talk about all these different pieces and what they do. To make it work, we need to go and include the Bootstrap JavaScript file. So if we go back to the Bootstrap docs, we click on download. There's also a JavaScript file that we need, which is right here. I'll use the CDN version, but it also comes inside the folder that you download. It's just called bootstrap.js or the minified version bootstrap.min.js. And let's add that. And we'll do it down at the bottom of our body and save. And I know we haven't talked about JavaScript. You don't know what a script is and what source here does. It doesn't matter. We're just going to plug it into Bootstrap. And now I'll refresh. And we still have one small problem which I'll show you here, it tells us that Bootstrap's JavaScript requires jQuery. Don't worry about what this is and how I got to this message, but I just wanted to show it to you so that you see the actual message we get. We need to require jQuery, which we also haven't talked about, but it's easy enough to go and get. We don't have to write any JavaScript. We don't have to know any JavaScript. We just have to include it. So all we need to do is search for jQuery CDN, which is on code.jQuery.com. And down here, we need to select the most recent version and copy this URL. This is a jQuery file. And then we'll go back. And down here, we're going to add another one of these script tags, basically copying this exact code. In fact, I'll do that to make it easier. Just duplicate that exact line and change this URL to be the jQuery URL. If all else fails, you can just type this out. It's not that bad of a URL but I got this by searching for jQuery CDN and we'll save. And this does need to come before Bootstrap's JavaScript file because it relies on jQuery. So one more time, don't worry too much about what it is, how it works, what jQuery is. That's all coming up a few units from now. But to get the most out of Bootstrap and in particular the nav bars and the drop down menus, we just need to have these two lines anytime we're using it. So we'll go back now and refresh. First of all, our drop down menus now work. As you can see, we now have drop down menus. We're not going to talk about that in this video. But as I resize and I get that hamburger, the hamburger now works. When I click on it, it toggles that hidden material. So the way that it works, right here, there's this little breakpoint, right here, where all of this content hides. And all that we see is the header and that button. And then when we click on the button, all that previously hidden content reappears. Let's get that to work now for us, but we're gonna do a much less complicated version where we just wanna hide these four links so that when we resize, these four links are hidden. And then when we click, they'll be displayed. To do that, we're gonna start by taking a look at how it's accomplished in this default version, this giant monster of a nav bar. And I'll just point out the important line right here, div, class, collapse, navbar collapse. Whatever we put inside of this div, 
will be collapsed when we hit mobile size. So it won't make the button for us, it won't do the toggling and the reappearing and hiding, but it will hide whatever content we put inside of it when we hit that tablet in mobile size. So I'm gonna copy this, and we just need to wrap it around the content we want to hide. And we wanna hide this here, these two ULs. So the four links we want to hide when we hit that smaller screen size. So we'll add in the closing div tag and save. And there is a line here, and this is important, and I'll get to it in just a moment. It won't impact us just yet. But if we refresh, you'll see now when I resize, there's a point right here where all that content inside of the collapsed div goes away. Now it doesn't reappear. We don't get this hamburger. We don't get a click on anything, but it has collapsed. It's gone away. And that's because we added in this line here, div class collapse navbar collapse. The next thing we need to do is add in the hamburger. And it is quite a bit of code, unfortunately. It's still much better than if we had to do it ourselves. But the hamburger is actually all of this right here. So I'm going to copy that and paste it on up inside of the navbar header before our coffee anchor tag. And we'll save. And I'll come back to what it does. Let's just refresh. And now if I resize, I get the hamburger. There we go. Now let me explain a little bit about how it works. So there's a button, and then inside that button there's three spans, and each one is responsible for making one of these bars. So it's not an image that we're seeing here, it's actually HTML that's making this. Little spans that are being styled into those narrow bars to make that hamburger. And then as far as the showing and hiding of the content when we click on it, what's really important is that we have this data target attribute. And whatever this is set to, in our case, BS example navbar collapse one, bootstrap example navbar collapse one, let's just change it to BS nav demo, just like that. Then we need to change the ID of the content that we want to actually collapse, that we want to show and hide. So we'll change it to match BS nav demo. Notice one important difference. We're not adding in the Octothorpe. So it's just like CSS. When we select something with CSS, we need to use that Octothorpe to target an ID. So we leave the ID as just the text, the name, BS nav demo. Here we add that Octothorpe in. So we'll save, refresh. Now if I resize, we get the hamburger and I click on it and it works to toggle that showing and hiding. Great. The last thing that I'll show to you is that if we move something outside of this collapse, so let's take these links here, the account or the about and contact, and we just move those right here outside of the collapse div, and I refresh, you can see that they don't actually collapse, they stay there. And then I click on that, and the other two that are inside of the collapse are toggled. Now, I'm not saying this looks good, but it does illustrate the importance of that collapse div. So whatever we put inside of collapse, whatever we have, in our case, four different links, two that are on the right, two that are on the left, they all will collapse whenever we hit that smaller mobile size. And then to make them show again, we click on this button here. And that button has a data target attribute, and whatever ID this corresponds to will be hidden and shown when we click on that. And that happens to be this ID here. Okay, so kind of a marathon, a lot of stuff that goes into making a bootstrap nav bar. But again, the way we got there was just by straight up copying this into our file and dissecting pieces of it. And that's how I make a nav bar pretty much every time. We just take that example code and figure out what pieces we need and go from there. Welcome back. In this lesson, I'm going to demonstrate the bootstrap grid system. And the grid system is probably the number one reason that people use bootstrap. The forms, the nav bars, the buttons are nice stylistic changes we can make with Bootstrap. But the Bootstrap grid system will act as the skeleton of our entire application. It's a really easy way for us to add structure and layout to our application. So let me show you a few examples of what you can do with the grid system. I have a few uh, sites open from Bootstrap Expo. This first one here is a product page for a water pitcher. And as I scroll down, 
Notice the layout here where we have three items side by side. And then also notice as I change size here, they scale down. And then when I hit tablet size, they stack on top of each other. So that's the bootstrap grid system at work, as is this right here, where we have another similar effect. They scale and then they stack on tablet and mobile size. Here's another example. This is an Icelandic musician named Olafur Arnolds. And as I scroll down on his site, we have some content that's built with the grid system here. As you can see, similar layout, but it's not just that. This is built with a grid system as well. This here, this content, these tour dates here. Basically using the grid system, we can say that we want some content to take up 100% of the screen. And then we can also use it to say that we want each one of these to take up 25% of the width of the screen until we hit the mobile size or the tablet size where they each take up 50 now. And then when we hit mobile, they each take up 100%. Same thing down here. It lets us divide the width of the screen into pieces and pick how many pieces we want each of our own elements to take up. And here's the last one we've seen already. It's called Creative Tim. And as we scroll down here, similar content here using the grid system and here as well. So this is all done with the grid system, all of this. So really important, very exciting stuff. It helps us lay things out so easily compared to what we'd have to do without Bootstrap. So we'll be using Bootstrap's grid system in pretty much every application we make using Bootstrap. And let me show you one of them. This is our Yelp Camp application. And notice that we have a grid of campgrounds, four across. And as I resize the screen, notice that they scale, and then we go to two across, and then down to mobile, we go to one across. And it's a really nice, easy to use mobile layout. So that's just one place where we'll use the grid system now let's get started on writing some code using the grid system. So I'll full screen this window and go back to getbootstrap.com. Under the CSS tab, we can click on grid system. There's quite a bit to the grid system, but I'm going to start by just pointing out a single number here, 12. This is really important to how the grid system works. So every container in Bootstrap can be divided into 12 different columns. And then using the grid system, we can pick how many of those 12 units each element should take up. So in this case, it looks like they have something taking up about 10 out of 12 units, and then over here, two out of 12 units, or it might be nine and three, but they have some ratio where they have more out of those 12 on this left side, and then a small fraction out of the 12 on the right side. So if we go back to Yelp Camp here, this is our container right here. And each one of these, out of 12 units, each one takes up three units. So we end up with four equal columns. And then we shrink it down right here. Now they each take up six units out of 12. So again, that number 12, very important. Now let's go and write our very first grid. So I have a file I've made, grid.html. It's empty except for the bootstrap CSS file. And to start, we need to define a container. Anytime we use the bootstrap grid, it needs to be inside of a container. So class equals container. And the first thing we need to do is define another div with class equal to row. Inside of each row, we have 12 units to pick from. So what we're going to start by doing is just doing a 50-50 split. We'll have one div that takes up 6 out of 12, and then another div that takes up 6 out of 12. So let's do that now. We'll add a div, and then I'll also add my second div in. And right now it's just two divs that are empty. They're not going to work. But what I'll do is add a class to the first one. And this will look a little bit weird. Column large six. And we'll do the same thing here. Class equals column large six. Then we'll add some content in here that will just say column large six. Same thing here. And as I do that, let's save. And we won't actually see very much. We won't see the grid itself. So to make that clearer, I'll define a class here inside of a style tag. What I'll do is define a class. I'll just call it pink. And I'll apply this class to our two divs so we can see them. Because right now they're just white, no border, and just a little bit of text. But if we add this in, 
so pink and then we want background to be pink and we'll do a purple border one pixel solid purple and then we'll apply the pink class to these two divs each one takes up six units now we go back and refresh there we go you can see we have two divs that take up exactly half of the container the container starts here and ends here and we've divided it into two so now we can go back and play around a little bit more and let's try adding in a third column and this time we'll make the middle column eight units and then the left and right will be two so we'll end up and I'll change these numbers here there we go we'll end up with a nice centered column in the middle and then two smaller columns on the left and right that we could use for a sidebar or something so that's the very basic concept underlying all of the bootstrap grid system we have 12 units going across whatever container we're working inside of and we can designate those 12 units in any way that we want so we could do 12 individual columns each one column large one and we could do that 12 times just like this make sure i don't lose count there we go and then we'll get rid of these two for now and if i refresh you'll see in one row we have 12 evenly sized columns each one takes up one unit and then i'll also show you we can add other rows so let's do that now div class equals row and it will just go below this first row that we have so inside of this one let's do a div class equals column dash large and let's do four so we'll split it up to three evenly sized units so column large four there we go just like that and let's go take a look now and you can see we didn't apply the pink class but we have three evenly sized columns that fall below the 12 evenly sized columns we created so we could add in the pink class just to make it easier to see what's happening and there we go so this is just a simple example we wouldn't actually have these pink boxes most likely on our site but as you can see here we have a grid where we have rows and each row has four columns going across each one is three units wide or here on this creative tim site we have three columns going across each one is four units wide same thing here three columns going across here we have four columns each one is three units wide so that's the very very basics of the grid in the next video we'll talk about how to make the grid responsive and have different layouts at different sizes right now we've been working with column large one i haven't explained what the large means and there are three other sizes and we'll see those in the next video and we'll also see how we can write nested grids where we can add another row inside of any of these columns and split that into a further 12 pieces. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll continue working with the Bootstrap Grid. In particular, there are two main features I wanna highlight. The first is that I wanna address the four different sizes that I briefly mentioned. We've been working with column LG, haven't talked about what that means, and there are three other sizes we'll work with. But I also wanna show you how we can nest grids inside of other grids to further divide those 12 units up into smaller pieces. Let's start though by talking about the four sizes. I'm gonna start by going back to the browser and taking a look at the demo that we built in the last lesson. So we have two rows, one that has 12 columns, one that has three going across. And watch what happens as I resize the window. Things scale just fine. And then we hit a breakpoint right here where everything changes. And each column now takes up a full 12 units going across and they stack on top of one another. And as I keep resizing, you won't notice any changes really. They all continue to take up 12 units and stack on top of one another. But there are actually four different sizes that we can specify. So we can have four different layouts. Right now, this is a mobile layout, which is extra small, XS. Then we get to small, which is like a tablet layout. And then medium, which is right here. This would be on a laptop or a smaller browser window. And then large, which we have right here. So it doesn't look like there's much of a difference except right here when we go between medium and large, but there are four sizes and we can specify ratios and proportions for each one of those sizes. So on the bootstrap docs, under the grid options here, grid system, 
you can see there's a table and it shows us the four different sizes. So there's extra small devices like phones, then small devices, which are tablets, medium devices, desktops, large devices are bigger desktops that are greater than 1200 pixels wide. And they each have a prefix that we can use. So column XS is extra small, SM is small, MD is medium, and LG is large, which is what we've been using. So let's say that I want my layout to stay the same at the large breakpoint. And then when we switch to medium right here, I want these 12 columns that each take up a single unit. I want them each to take up two units instead. So we'll end up with six going across and then a further six below. So let's focus on that. And to simplify things, I'll actually get rid of our second row for now. So all that we have is this right here. So when we hit this medium breakpoint right there, I don't want this to happen. Instead, I want six columns going across. To do that, I just add in another class. So I'll do that to each one, and it's going to be column medium. So when this grid is at the medium size, we want them each to take up two units, and we'll save. Now let's go and refresh, I'll make it full size. Nothing changes because we're at the large size. But now when I switch to medium right here, notice that they each take up two units now and we get six going across. And if I keep shrinking it down, we then hit the small breakpoint and that's where it switches, where each column now goes all the way across full 12 units and they stack on top of one another. So let's go back and re let's go back to our sublime and revive our old grid. So we'll get rid of this one because it's not that common to actually have 12 different components going across. Usually you're working with three or four, sometimes six, but 12 individual columns is pretty rare. So let's go back to this one. And what we'll do is try and recreate the grid layout of the Oliver Arnold's tour schedule here. So it starts at four going across, then we shrink down, there's the medium breakpoint, and we're still at four. And then we get to the small breakpoint, and we go to two across, and then mobile extra small is one. So that's what we'll try and recreate, not the content, just the structure. So we'll go back here, and we wanna start with four going across, which means that each one takes up three units. And then we can change the text here, and let's just have it say tour date. So if we refresh, we should have four columns going across, which we do which is exactly what this starts out as, four going across. And the only difference really is the actual content. So inside of each column, we would just add an H3, a paragraph, a button, and whatever other content we need, a little HR it looks like, and we'd still get the same spacing. All right, so the next breakpoint is when we get to medium, it stays at four. So what you might think that we need to do is specify the medium breakpoint, so when we hit this, they should still each take up three units. We can go back to Sublime and add that in again, column medium three and save. And they each start at three units. We hit medium and they stay at three units. And then we hit small and now they're 12 units again. And what we want, if we're following this, is that when we hit the small size, they now each take up six units. So we can go in here and add that in, column small six. So at the large size, each one of these takes up 25%, three units out of 12. At the medium size, same thing, they take up 25%. And then at the small size, which is for tablets, they each then take up 50%. So let's refresh, they each take up three units, and then three units, then we hit small, and now they each take up six units. And then we hit extra small, and they automatically take up the full 12 units, which is what we want. So you can see when we hit small, we want them to take up one unit going across. All right, so we have that down. There is a small change we can make. If we go back to Sublime, you'll see that we're specifying this three units twice for the large and medium. We can actually get rid of column large three 
and just put medium in there. And Bootstrap will know that because we're setting the medium to be three and we're not explicitly setting the large, it will just take what we set for medium and apply it to large. So it works the same way. Nothing has changed. I already refreshed. It looks identical. Our medium breakpoint is still there and our small works. So we don't have to specify that twice. So just let me command Z. We got rid of that and it works exactly the same way. And in fact, if we take a look, if we go to the website, I bet that if we inspect each of these, you'll see, there we go. Column small six, column medium three, exactly what we had. Now that we've covered those four different sizes, hopefully you can see how versatile and useful the grid system can be. Let's go back and now I'll address nesting grids. Let's suppose that inside of this first column here, I want to split it in half and have something on the left side of that and something on the right side. I can actually go and add in another row inside of there. So class equals row. And then inside of that row, I can add in a div with class equal column, and we'll just do large for now, column large six, and another one, column large six. And I'll just write some text here, halfway and other half. Let's change it to be first half and other half, and we'll save, and let's give them a class of pink. So what we've done now is we'll have three going across still, or four going across, one, two, three, four, and in the first one, we've split it into a further 12 units by adding another row in, and we're using the first six to say something, and we're using the second six to say something else. Save, refresh, there you go. And to make it even more obvious, let me give them another class, let's call it orange, it doesn't exist yet, and define this up here, dot orange, and it will have background orange, and we'll add in border, one pixel solid red, and let's actually do dashed. Okay, refresh, you can see now we still have these four things going across. Each one takes up three units, but we split the first one into six units and six units by adding that row in. And you have to add the row. You can't just start doing this where you have a column instead of a column. There must be a row. And let's do one more. Let's split this last one right here into six small pieces inside. So we need to add a row inside of that. Div class equals row. Inside of there, we need another div. And we'll have six of these where we have column large two, because they're each taking up two out of 12 units. And we want six. And then we'll go on each one. And let's add in that orange class, just so that we can see them. Okay, so we have four big columns going across. The first one we split in half. The last one we split in six pieces. And you can't really see anything because we didn't put any text in there. So let's go do that. Or rather, let's actually just give a width or a height to the class orange. Let's make them each 50 pixels. And if I refresh, you see that now everything that has orange, that class orange, takes up 50 pixels in height. So we have our two evenly divided columns and then our six evenly divided columns inside of these four evenly divided top level columns. So that's all of the important pieces of the grid system in a nutshell. We have 12 units in every row. You split them up however you'd like. There are four sizes, large, medium, small, extra small, and you can reassign those 12 units at any of those four breakpoints, those four different sizes. And that's how you end up with these nice responsive layouts. And generally the pattern that you see is that on mobile sites, so on the extra small size, most sites will have their content just stack on top of one another, like we would here. If I shrink this down, this is the common layout on mobile where you don't have multiple pieces of content in the same row. Okay, let's go back to Sublime. Make sure I talked about the three main objectives. So we talked about the purpose, the point of the grid system, helps us lay things out. It's awesome. Understand the four different sizes, those are large, medium, small, extra small, and then write nested grids. And that's what we're doing here, where we add a row inside of a column, and then we can fill that row 
with further sub columns. In the next video, we're going to build a simple image grid using the grid system. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to build a small project using what we've learned so far about Bootstrap. It will include a lot of the components we've been talking about, including a navbar, the jumbotron, and the grid system. I also threw in one or two new things, including the icons here. We haven't seen how to do those just yet. And also the fact that this navbar, as I scroll, you'll see it stays fixed to the top. So it doesn't scroll away. We have a fixed navbar, which we also haven't seen just yet. And then lastly, we're changing some of the colors of the default bootstrap components. So this is actually a slightly different shade of gray. This is a shade of blue and the nav bar has some different colors. So I'll be showing you how to do all of that. Before we get started writing any code, I just want to take a moment to point out the fact that these images for the most part are from a website, a great resource called Unsplash. So Unsplash provides a bunch of beautiful high res photos that you can do whatever you want with. You can read their license here but it's pretty much whatever you want. It's a Creative Commons license, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure you don't really care about that, but the photos are really awesome. And I'm using a lot of these, eight of them, in fact, in our gallery. And that leaves one image, which is this one right here, that I actually took myself. I've been taking a photography class, and this is the first thing I've taken that looks half decent, I think, even though compared to these ones, it's not looking so hot. Anyway, if you wanna use these exact same images, which is not important, this will work with any images at all, but if you want the exact same ones, I've included all of the links in this file, gallery.md, that I've uploaded along with this video. And I've also included the two colors that we're going to use, the dark blue and the light gray. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, let's now get started on the project. So I have an empty file, gallery.html. I'll add in my HTML skeleton here, and we'll just call this image gallery. And the first thing we need to do is include Bootstrap. And I'm just going to copy over the CDNs from an old project. So I'll do that right now. Here we go. I'm linking to the Bootstrap CDN. And while I'm here, I will also grab the Bootstrap CSS and jQuery CDNs that we did in the navbar lesson and put those at the bottom here so that when we add the navbar in, we don't have to go hunt for these files or for these script tags. So we'll save. And the first thing that we can do is add in our Jumbotron. That's nice and easy. So we'll have a div and that will be class equals Jumbotron. And then inside the Jumbotron, we'll start with an H1 that just says the image gallery. There we go. And we'll save and let's make sure this works. So we'll open up this file. So we have Bootstrap included, we're seeing the font change, we're seeing this gray from the Jumbotron. Let's now make sure that it's inside a container, like it is here, rather than what we have where it just goes all the way across the screen. So we'll do that, div class equals container. There we go. And let's indent this properly and refresh, and we'll go back. All right, so we have the Jumbotron, Let's add in this paragraph now. We'll come back and do the icon, but that's just a paragraph tag beneath the H1. We'll save. Feel free to put whatever text you want there. And we're done with the Jumbotron for now. So let's go back and let's now do the navbar. And I'm not gonna type the navbar from scratch for two reasons. One is that it's quite a bit of code. It will take a long time in this video, but two is the fact that I almost never type a navbar from scratch. As I mentioned in the navbar video, most of the time my workflow is that I go to the bootstrap site or to a previous site that I've made with a navbar and I copy that and I dissect it and I get rid of the pieces that I don't want, I add some new pieces in. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I already have a navbar that I did in the navbar.html application. It's right here. And I'm just gonna copy that in and then we'll tweak it a little bit. So let's copy it in and I'll go back and we'll just put this at the very top of the file, just like that. And let's see what we get. Refresh, and we have the nav bar. It's close. We'll wanna change the uh, brand here. We also wanna change the color eventually, and we wanna make sure that it's fixed to the top, which it isn't right now, but we'll get there. Let's go back and just change the brand. So instead of coffee, I called mine images. You can call this whatever you want, of course. Make sure that it works. 
okay? The next thing that I'll show you is a quick change we can make to alter the color, where up here, instead of navbar default, we can do navbar inverse, and I'll show you what that looks like. We get a dark navbar now where the colors have been inverted, where the text is light, and we get a dark background. It's still not the blue color that I'm going for over here, and the font is also not white, but we'll come back and fix that. This is close enough for now. Now we can focus on the actual image gallery, on that grid down here. And let's start by looking at how it behaves on the solution. So it starts with three images going across, and then as I resize, it goes down to two, and then it goes down to two, and then finally, at the small size, it goes to one, as you can see here, and we have one image going across. Let's begin by setting up the grid for this large size where we have three going across. Remember, we have 12 units total, so if we want three going across, we're gonna designate each of them as four units. So let's set that up just below our Jumbotron. Still inside the container though, we'll just do div class equals row, and then inside of that, we'll have div class equals, and we want it to be four units. So we'll do column large dash four and hit enter. And we can start by just putting some text here. And then I'll duplicate that because we want three of those. And I won't worry about fixing the indentation yet because we're gonna make a bigger change in just a moment. But let's refresh and we get those three columns going across. So the next thing that we wanna do is get some images going. And I'll start by just taking the URL of my Golden Gate Bridge photo, and we're going to add an image tag rather than text. So image source equals that, the Golden Gate Bridge URL, and I'll just paste that three times and save. And if we go back, we have a problem, which is that that image is huge. Even though we have those three columns, our image isn't staying inside of our column. It's not shrinking down, as you can see. What we'll do to fix this is add in a little bit more bootstrap I haven't showed you yet to create this nice little border around it, and it's called a thumbnail. All we need to do is write a div with class equal to thumbnail, and then whatever image we put inside of it will be scaled down to fit inside the column. And it also gets this little border here, which I think looks pretty nice. So to do that, I'm actually going to get rid of what we have with those two, just go back to one single image and add in a div class equals thumbnail, indent that properly, and we wrap that around the image and save. Now if we refresh, you'll see that we get a single image that takes up the appropriate amount of space inside that grid. This is the column, and it has a little border around it, and the image isn't gigantic, which is great. So let's make sure it works if we duplicate this. So this is one image. Let's duplicate it three times and see what happens. Refresh, and there we go. We have three images. I'll go ahead and add six more in so that we have nine total like we do here. And we actually don't have to add separate rows. We can just put them all in the same row. So I'll copy all three that we have so far two times and save. That will give us nine images. And if I refresh, you'll see that they automatically wrap to the next line. So we only have to have one row and add in those columns, and it automatically knows if we want each image to take up four units, then that means three per row, and then we need three rows of images. I'll go back and change all these image URLs at the end of the video. I don't wanna make you watch that. Very uninteresting, just copying and pasting. But let's focus on the rest of this grid. So right now, as soon as I hit medium, it goes to one image across, which is not what we want. What we're looking for is two images across at that medium breakpoint. And then after the medium breakpoint, which is there, we hit small and we still want it to stay at two. So to fix that in ours, where it goes to one immediately at the large breakpoint or at the medium breakpoint, and then small and extra small stays at one, we can go back in here and we'll change all of these. I'm gonna select and hit Command D to select all instances of column large four 
and then I'll hit the left or right arrow to move the cursor. And now I can edit them all at once. And what I want to do, I could add in column medium six because we want two per row and that will work. And if I go back and refresh, you'll see they stay at three per row. And then I hit the medium breakpoint and they go to two, but then I hit small and it jumps to one. And ours, when we hit small, the solution stays at two. So to fix that, rather than doing column medium six, we can do column small six and go back again, refresh this version. We hit medium, we go to two, we hit small, we stay at two. And then we go to extra small and we're at one, one image per row. Perfect. So that's all we have to do for the grid. And we're done with most of the functionality here. Very, very quick to get that up and running. What we want to focus on now are some of the colors and also the icons. I'll start by showing you how we add icons using Bootstrap. So on get Bootstrap, if you go to components, there are these glyph icons up top and there's a bunch of them to pick from. And we'll find one that we want to use. And the one that I'm using, I'll just do a search for, I think it's camera. So there's this camera here, and I'm actually not using that camera. It's slightly different. The one that I'm using is a more retro camera, and I'll show you how to add that in. It's actually not part of Bootstrap, but let's start with the regular camera that comes with Bootstrap. So we write Glyphicon and then Glyphicon dash camera. And if you scroll further down, you can see where they explain how to use it. You create a span where class is equal to Glyphicon and then Glyphicon dash the name of the Glyphicon. So let's copy this span in and we'll start by doing it inside the H1. Just put it at the very beginning of the H1 and we want Glyphicon dash camera and we'll save and refresh. And just like that, we can get a camera in there. And if we want a space, we can either do it through padding or we can just add a space right there and we get a space. We can do the exact same thing for the nav bar. And I used one, I think it's called photo. Go double check up here. We can do a search on this page for photo picture. There it is. Glyphicon, Glyphicon dash picture. So we'll go up to the navbar brand right here and we paste in that span again. And then inside the span, the class should be Glyphicon picture. And we'll add a space there as well. We go back to our site, refresh, and we now have the little picture there, and we also have the camera. Next, let's tackle the navbar, and we'll start by making it fixed to the top. So you can see right now the navbar scrolls away, but on the solution, it stays there. And to do that, it's a single class that we have to add to our navbar. So right up here, we want navbar-fixed-top and save. And if we refresh, you'll see it's fixed to the top. There is one small issue, which is that our content is now behind it a little bit. And we want it to have that normal spacing above the jumbotron. What we need to do is add a little bit of padding to our body. And it happens to be 70 pixels. The bootstrap docs will tell you that if you ever forget 70 pixels of padding is what we want. That's the width of the nav bar. So we'll go here and we'll create a style sheet now and I'll call it gallery.css and then inside select body padding top 70 pixels and then we need to add that in link to that style sheet which is gallery.css now let's make sure that's working there we go we have our spacing back and our nav bar is still fixed to the top as you can see perfect now all we really need to focus on are the colors. Let's start with the Jumbotron. So everything inside the Jumbotron is just a different shade of blue. And that shade of blue I have in this document here. 2C3E50. We'll go to our style sheet and we can just select the Jumbotron and give it a color and everything inside of it will adopt that color. Just like that. Refresh, and you can see everything has changed to be blue, including the Glyphicon. The Glyphicon is just treated as text. It's actually 
a font, so you can change the color of it using the color property. Now let's tackle the navbar, which is a little trickier. The background color isn't bad. All we need to do is select navbar inverse, or we could do navbar or navbar fix top, but I'll do navbar inverse and then give it a background color of that blue background and paste that in and refresh. And you can see it changes to be blue, but to change the color here, I want them to be white rather than that gray that they are. If I just style all anchor tags, which is what these are, if I just style all anchor tags to be white, it won't quite work. So I'll show you what I mean. Anchor tag color white. I'll go back. It doesn't take effect. And this is a great use for the inspector. If we inspect it, take a look what's happening. So we can see that our color white is crossed off and the color is being assigned right here, this line. Color is this gray. And if we uncheck it, they go back to being the white that we want them to be. And that's because this is a more specific selector. If you can think back to that lesson I did on specificity, this is calculated to have a higher number, a higher specificity index than what we had here, which is just poor little anchor tag versus this up here. It's multiple classes. Remember each one of those is 10 times more specific than just an anchor tag. So what we want to do is write a selector that will be just as specific. And we can just steal this one right here. So we'll go into here, can paste that in and then change color to be white. So we'll just override the exact same selector that Bootstrap had. And it's important that our styles occur after Bootstrap so that we can override it. And if we refresh, we now get white links. Lastly, we'll do the same thing to the navbar brand. So as you can see, that's inside of navbar dash brand. If we select that dot navbar brand, and we give that a color of white and save and go back. It still doesn't work and we have the same problem. So if we inspect it, you'll see that it's crossed off our styles down here where we're turning it white has been crossed off and rather its color is being changed by this line, navbar brand inside of navbar inverse. So we can also just steal that and overwrite that. So we just need dot navbar inverse navbar brand. So basically we're, we're writing styles that are gonna clash head to head in a battle of the styles between Bootstrap and our styles, and they're identical in the selectors. So because ours comes second, they're going to come out on top. They're gonna to win. We'll go back, refresh, and there we go. We have most of the styles done. There's one really minor thing that you probably won't notice on the screencast. The color of the gray on the Jumbotron is ever so slightly different. So I have that color here. I'll just copy it and then go to our CSS and we'll just change the background of the Jumbotron to be that gray color. And pay close attention as I refresh, hopefully you can see it change. It just changed, it's a slightly bluer looking gray. So let's test everything out. Let's resize. Does our navbar work? The JavaScript works just fine. There we go, everything looks good. The last thing I'll show you is how we can use a different icon here. The one that I'm using is from a library called Font Awesome. Font Awesome is a simple library that includes a lot of different icons, way more than the built-in bootstrap glyph icons. So you can get to it at fontawesome.github.io. I'm on the homepage here. And if we click on icons, there are over 580 different icons. You can see them all here. And one of the nice features is that you can search through them, which you can't really do on bootstrap very easily. So we can search for photo and we get camera and the camera retro, which is what I used. But before we can use any of them, we need to install it. So if you go to getting started, they have a nice CDN that you can just copy and just put that inside of your application. So we'll do that up top, paste that in. And now we can use font awesome icons. And it's really, really easy. Actually, if you click on any icon that you like, let's say I wanna use the peace sign, you can click on it, and they give you the little bit of code that you can copy. 
So it's an icon with class equal to FA for font awesome and then FA dash the name of the icon. Let's just replace the camera icon with this. So we'll have a big peace sign. We'll save and refresh and we have our peace sign. So font awesome is pretty awesome. It's really popular. Lots of great icons. As you can see, pretty much any icon you would ever need. They have a bunch of the standard ones, pause, play buttons, forward, backwards, different icons for technology and different internet icons. But they also have some more fun ones like peace signs and, and I think they also have a Spock hand. Yep, there we go. So you can use any of these just like you use any other font. So if you wanna change the color, you just change the color property. If you wanna change the size, you actually change font size. So I'm gonna use that retro camera. Oops, I'll search for that again, which is camera dash retro. So I need to do FA dash camera dash retro and save, refresh, and we get that retro camera. All right, so we're finished with the gallery aside from actually changing the image URLs, which I'll do as soon as I finish this wrap up. You probably don't wanna watch it anyways, but in case you do, I'll include it at the end. So we have a nav bar up here. We made a small change, which was we used nav bar inverse, which is how we got the black and white nav bar, but then we actually changed the colors anyway, so it didn't really matter. And then we also used nav bar fixed top, which is how it stays up at the top. We used a grid system down here, and then we use a jumbotron. I introduced glyphicons, the built-in bootstrap icons, which are relatively limited. There are most of the things that you would use, but occasionally they won't have something. Or sometimes you just prefer the way that the font awesome icons look. Font awesome is definitely more popular than the bootstrap glyphicons. And the other new thing I showed you was the thumbnail class, which we can just put around an image and it will constrain that image into our grid and it adds this nice little border here. And then lastly, we talked about specificity and how we had to battle the bootstrap styles if we wanted to change the color, the background color, we wanted to change the background color of the nav or the font color of the links, and also the color of the nav brand right here. Okay, so that's it. In the next video, I'm gonna show you how we can make a landing page with bootstrap. And as I promised, I'm now gonna go copy and paste those image links to make nine different images here. So if that's something you wanna see, hang around for the next minute or two. Okay. So I'll just split screen this and I'll copy some of these over this first one. And I'm just gonna replace this one here. And then I'll do the next one. And I'll replace this one here. And then the next one, I'm sure this is riveting. And I'll keep going on down the line, just like that. All right, we're past halfway, we're getting close. And the last one, I think we did it. Let's save, make sure everything looks good. Refresh. And we have nine different images. Awesome. All right, so now I'm done, done. Hopefully you enjoyed making that image gallery. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're gonna use Bootstrap to create a landing page for a fictitious startup. Our startup is called Perfect Match. It's very funny, I know. It's a human feline dating app. And I'll leave it up to you to interpret what human feline dating is. It might be relatively innocuous. It could just be matching shelter cats with lonely humans. Could be something else, I don't know. Let's get started by doing a quick tour of the site. And by tour, I really just mean pointing out a few features. There's not much here. We don't actually have this hooked up. It doesn't do anything yet. So it's really just HTML and CSS, but that's all that we've covered so far. So we have a nav bar, perfect match, home, about, and contact links. They don't actually go anywhere. Sign up and log in on the right side, two little icons there. We get our hamburger. I can click on it. All of those links are now inside that hamburger. Then we have a big background image that stays centered and it covers the entire background. So in the middle, we have the name of our startup, Perfect Match with two R's. And then we have our caption, the only human feline dating app. And then we have a little HR here, horizontal rule, and then a button to get started with an icon. And as I shrink this, 
it all stays in the middle and it also moves up a little bit so that we don't have some sort of awkward layout on your mobile device where the text starts halfway down the page. So we move it up a bit and it stays centered. This layout's really easy to do in Bootstrap, but it's relatively effective for a landing page. All that we have is a single column that takes up the entire width. So this column goes 12 units across. We're not dividing it up into any sections, just one column, 12 units across, and then we center everything inside of that column. So let's get started. First thing we need to do is make a file. I have one called index.html. I'll add this in, my regular boilerplate, perfect match. And let's start by adding in Bootstrap. And I'll use a CDN, Bootstrap CDN. Let's do CSS and JavaScript while we're here. We will need that JavaScript for the nav bar. So we need a link tag. Then we'll get the JavaScript. Copy that. And we'll put this down at the bottom, which is a script tag. And then we set source equal to that URL. Now, if we open this up, okay, open up the console. We have a small problem, which is that we need jQuery as well in order for the bootstrap JavaScript. Remember back from the nav bar lesson, we need to require jQuery. So we'll get a CDN for that. We'll do the minified version, copy that URL. Then finally, we go back here and we have to do it before the link to bootstrap to the JavaScript. Otherwise, it will still not know about jQuery. So it needs to load jQuery first. Now let's try again, if I refresh. Okay, we don't see anything, but that's a good sign because we don't see any errors. Let's begin with the text in the middle, all of this content here. So we need to create a container and then inside the container, we need a row. So div class equals container. And then inside of there, we'll have another div. We always need that row anytime we're using the grid system. And then our div that's going to be class equal to column dash large 12. And that will span all the way across that container. And then inside of there, we're going to have an H1 that will just say perfect match and save. And let's leave it at that, refresh. And it's not really what we want yet. And that's because there's a few things we need to do. The first is that we need to center everything in that column. So if we inspect what we're dealing with here, you can see that the H1 goes all the way across and we just need to center it inside of that. And the second is that we need to push it down a bit. We need to add some padding or margin so that it doesn't go right to the top of our page. Let's start by adding in the rest of the content. So we also have the only human feline dating app and that will just be an H3. And we could really play with that. It could be any element that we want, but I'll make it an H3, the only human dash feline dating app. And then we can add in that horizontal rule, which won't look like much, but we'll style it after the fact. And then we'll also add in a button. And the class on that button, if we take a look, this is a bootstrap button default and it's a button large. Let's go back. So we need BTN and then the color default and then the size BTN LG for large. And in here, we'll just add the text, which is get started. And save. Let's see what we end up with. All right, so we have our content now. Next, let's center it inside of the grid. And then we'll focus on the padding and moving it down. But to start, we'll just center it inside this grid. And to make that easier, I'm gonna group it all inside of a div so that we don't have to center each thing individually. We don't have to center the H1 and then the H3 and then the button. Rather, we can group it in a div and just center that div with one line. Let's make a div. And I'll give it an ID of content. And then we'll put everything inside of there. So the H1, the H3, the HR, and the button. And we'll properly indent and save. So nothing should look different if I refresh the page. Before we do that, let's add in our style sheet. So I'll add in a link tag. 
and I'll call my style sheet app.css. It doesn't exist yet, so I need to make it. Save it, app.css in the same directory. And let's start with something simple like all h1s are purple, just to make sure it works. Okay, let's go back, refresh, and we get a purple h1. Great. So now let's select that div we added with ID of content and center it. So get rid of that and we need an ID content. And all we need to do is text align center. Let's go back. There we go. So things are center aligned now. Next, we'll push this down a bit, 25% down the page to be exact with padding equal to 25%. So in here, We'll do padding top, 25%. And rather than giving it a hard number of pixels, if we keep it as a percentage, it's a little bit more responsive. So that's right in the center. And then 25% changes as we resize the screen. Great. Now let's add in the background image. So the image that I'm using, this adorable cat and human interaction going on here, is from this Unsplash website which I introduced in the last video, where we created the Bootstrap image grid. And they have all sorts of really great high quality images that you can use without any issue. And the one that I used is right here. I searched for cat. The link's in the description as well. Here's the URL of this image. Just right click, copy the image URL. Now let's go back and I'm gonna add it to the body as a background image. So background, and then we can give it a URL, which is that giant URL right there. And if we leave it at that, let's format this a little, refresh, we get a gigantic background image. And all we can tell is that this is some sort of startup for fingernails. So we need to resize it. And to do that, we'll use background size and change that to be cover. And if I refresh again, we're getting closer. This will make the image as small as possible while still covering the entire width and height of the screen. So it won't change the aspect ratio, it won't skew the image in any way, but it will stretch in both directions as much as it needs to, but the minimum amount that it needs to, to fit on our screen. And it's still not perfect. And what we wanna do is not change the size of it, but change the position. We're going to center it. Background position, center. Let's save that. We're closer, but it's still not a perfect match as far as the image goes. And those changes will come later. For now, I wanna focus on adding in the nav bar. And to do that, I'm gonna to go to the Bootstrap Docs and go to Components. And I've mentioned this before, I always do this if I'm adding in a Bootstrap nav bar. It's just too much stuff to remember otherwise. And I just copy this right here. We'll take the entire nav to start, go back to our app here and just put it right at the top. This is definitely not the nav that we want, but it contains the pieces that we want. And if I refresh, it's close enough. So there's a few changes we want to make. The first and the easiest one is that our content on the solution is in a container. So it doesn't go all the way to the edges like it does here. So we can go back and inside our nav bar, we just change this to be div class container. And if we go back now, and you can see that because we added in that container, we now have some spacing, just like we do over here on the solution. Now let's get to work on the actual content of the nav. So the easiest thing is to change the brand, which right now just says brand, back in here, this line. Class equals navbar brand, and we'll change it to perfect match. And save, try it out. Okay, good. Now let's get rid of this form. We don't need this at all. So our form all starts right here. Get rid of that entire thing. Refresh. Let's also get rid of the drop down. We don't need that. So that starts right here. This li that ends there. Refresh again. Now we have a single link. So we'll start with these two links which are supposed to be sign up and log in. That's this link right here. So we can change that one to be sign up. 
and then duplicate it, just an li with an anchor tag inside of it, and this one will be login. Let's check it out. Great, so the icons will come at the end. We have the two links. Now we need three links here. We already have two of them, and we'll get rid of that dropdown. So we need home, about, and contact. So we'll locate that dropdown, which is right here. Class equals dropdown. Let's get rid of it. And our navbar is simplified a lot. Now we have two different links, and I'll actually get rid of both of them and do it from scratch. So we'll add in one li with an anchor tag, and then we'll do that three times. This first one should say home. The next one is about, and the last one is contact. Let's check it out. There we go, our three links. One minor thing, home is supposed to be active. And in Bootstrap, that's really easy. All that we have to do is add class equals active to the li, not the anchor tag, but the parent li. And now we end up with home being the active link. Great. Okay, so that's our navbar. And if we resize, you'll see that we already have this hamburger working just fine. We do have a problem, which is that our background image is messed up. We'll cover that in just a little bit. But we have the hamburger working fine. Everything looks good. Now let's address the font. So the font that I used over here is Lato, L-A-T-O. It's from Google Fonts. So I'll go to Google Fonts and look for Lato, L-A-T-O. There we go. Add to collection. Let's use it. And we'll get normal and bold also because we want our H1 to be bolded. Okay, and then we'll add this link right into our application. Up top here, save. Now in our app CSS, we're gonna apply that font to everything. So I'm gonna select inside the body, font family is Lado. And let's make sure that it's loading correctly. See what we have, refresh and our font changes. It's hard to see because the text is dark, but it changed. You can also see it on the nav bar here. It's changed and it matches what we have in the solution. Now let's change the text color of the H1 and the H3. Right now it's that dark default bootstrap color. We'll go in here and we could do H1 color white and H3 color white and refresh, and we get white text just like that. What we could also do though, is combine these two because they're identical and do H1 comma H3, and that will make both of those white. Whenever we have a comma, it just selects different groups. So all H1s, all H3s, and it looks exactly the same. But we can even simplify this more and just assign everything in the body to be color white. And you might think that'd be a problem. It might change our button, it might change our nav bar, but remember that those are more specific. We have classes from Bootstrap that are doing that versus these are just plain H1s and H3s. They don't have any classes or IDs and they're easier to override with their own styles. By setting the body color to white, the H1 and the H3 inherited that color and everything else did as well. It was just overridden. So if we inspected let's say this button and we take a look when we select it and you see that color is set to this color 333 by the class button default. But if we keep scrolling down, you'll see that the body right here set color to white and it just happens to be crossed off. All right, so again, that sets both of them to be white. Now let's work on the font size. So our H1, we want it to be bolded, which it's currently not. So that needs to be bold. And I want it to be five EMs, which is five times bigger, remember, than the parent element. So we'll select H1 and we'll give it a font weight of 700, which is how we use the bold. Refresh, you can see it's bolded now. Let's also make it much larger. So font size, 5 EM. Now go back, and there we go. So that's looking closer now. 
this ratio between the H1 and the H3 looks exactly the same. We don't need to do anything to the H3. Let's now get the image to behave the way that we want it to. And to do that, I'm going to show you something that we haven't seen before. I'm going to move the dock to the right side. And if I inspect the HTML element or the body, you'll see that both of them stop before the end of the page. So about right here, that's the end of the HTML document. So when I tell my image to cover the body and I set its background size to be cover and background position to be center, it takes into account the size of the body. And when the body ends right here, it behaves differently. What we'll do to fix this is we'll give the HTML element a height of 100%, which means take up 100% of the container, which is just the entire document window. HTML height 100%. And we'll go back. Let's make it full screen now and refresh. And our image works the way that we expect it to. And I shrink down and that looks good to me too. Now we have two main things left to focus on. The first one is the HR. It's way too wide for us. It's supposed to be a lot smaller. And then I also want to focus on the font here. We'll start by getting the HR to work. And all we want to do is give it a width of 400 pixels. So in our CSS, we'll select HR, do it at the bottom. Width is 400 pixels. There we go. Another thing that I'll do that's a little bit sneaky that you may not have noticed is I'm going to go in here and give it a border on top, one pixel solid, and then I have a color here, which is F8, 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 and then a border bottom as well, which is one pixel solid, and this will be a transparent color, zero, 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 zero point two. So this will give it the effect of a shadow. So pay attention, it's really hard to see. I don't even know if that will pick up on the screencast. But what we have is a border, and then right below the border, a light gray line that makes it look like there's a slight shadow. It shows up a little bit better over the lighter colors. Okay, so if you can't see that, you'll have to trust me, or you can get rid of the background image and it will be easier to see there as well. Next, let's focus on the icons which I used Font Awesome for. So I have it open, fontawesome.io. And we'll just get the CDN here as well. If you click on Get Started, there's a CDN that you can just copy there. Put that in our application. You can also just do that up top. Save. And then we'll take a look at the actual icons. And the first one that I know that we used is a paw. And to do it, all we need is I class equals FA FA dash paw. So I put that inside the button. So if we go to the button right before get started, I added that in. Now if we go back and refresh, you can see we have that little button there and we have a paw print. Next we have two icons here for sign up and log in. And those two, I remember what they are. So I'm just going to do that here next to sign up. After we write sign up, we're going to add in another icon, except this time class is not fa paw, but fa dash user dash plus, which gives us that icon with the plus sign. And login is the same thing without the plus. So fa dash user. And we have those two icons. There's one other thing that I did that you may not have noticed, which is the text shadow. So there's a shadow around all of the text here. You can see it there. You can see it over here. It's around the H1 and the H3. And text shadow is something we can set with CSS, text-shadow. And there's kind of a lot of pieces to it. So you can see here, we're setting the offset X, the offset Y, so how far away from the words should the shadow go. Then we're also setting the radius of that blur, so basically how thick should it be, and then the color. And the shadow that I'm using is a little bit complicated. There's a lot of pieces, so I'm going to go and type it one piece at a time in the CSS file. 
So inside of the content div, we'll add text dash shadow. And then the first one we'll do zero pixels, four pixels, three pixels. And I'll make it really obvious to start by making it red. And if I refresh, there's the shadow that we're adding first. Now we'll go and add the second one with a comma and indent a little bit. And then we want zero pixels, eight pixels, 13 pixels, and then I'll do orange here. You can take a look at that one. You can see we have this more blurred one underneath that's bright orange. And then there's a third shadow, which is zero pixels, which remember this first number is the X offset, and then the Y offset, 18 pixels, and then 23 pixels is the blur radius, and we'll make this one yellow. And you can see we have the bright red, tighter shadow, and then the orange one that's a little bit further away, and then the yellow one that is a lot more blurred and a lot wider. So we wanna change those colors. We don't wanna be working with that. So the colors are a little bit less exciting. The first one, RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.4. The next one, very similar. Instead of 0 0.4, it's 0 0.1. And then one more, that's also 0 0.1. So using RGBA, we're just setting different shades of gray. And there we go, so much less exciting, but hopefully you can still see it here. It's a lot more subtle, but it just adds a little bit of depth to the page. Great, so that's all we needed to do. Let me go back and just wrap a few things up. The big point I wanna make here is that we can use Bootstrap and rely on it, but we're not relying on all of its styles. So yes, we kept the navbar the same, although in the last video I showed you how you can change the navbar color, but we changed the fonts, we added background images, so we really just use Bootstrap as the underlying foundation, and then we add in all the styles on top. And it didn't take much, but I think we made something that looks relatively respectable with just a few lines of code. And let's be honest, half of all of that is from this one text shadow line right there. Awesome, so we made this site, looks relatively good. We're done with Bootstrap for now. We're then moving on to JavaScript in the next unit, which is really exciting. We will be moving away from creating sites and things that look nice for a little bit, just so that we can focus purely on JavaScript, but then we'll bring everything back together and make some beautiful sites that actually do things that don't just look nice. So that's coming up soon. Hopefully you enjoyed Bootstrap, enjoyed this unit. And as always, I recommend that you download the code if you have any questions, it's in the description of this video. All right, I'll see you in the next unit.